I want to uh, thank all of you who uh, helped me and Michelle out. We had our baby girl, Heron Selah Girls, a month ago. And for those of you who brought food over to us, it really it meant a lot as those first weeks are sleepless and you find it being hard to make time to actually make a decent meal. We had a lot of microwave pizzas the first week. So thank you. Those of you who uh, brought us food, if, if you left a dish at our house, we got like a bunch of casserole dishes in the back of our car. So see us afterwards, and we'd like to like <laughs> get those back to you. She's been real sweet um, having the daughter. So uh, if you want to see her, Michelle's here, and you can say hello to our girl later on. Um, maybe we could all bow our heads together and invite the Lord to come speak to us. Uh, Lord Jesus, we want to open our hearts and our minds and our souls as best as possible, Lord, to allow you in to minister, uh, to make your residence inside of us. You said you want to come and live with us. Um, you want to make your home in us, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and restore our household and put things back in order that have gotten out of hand the dysfunctions inside of our home, of our heart, Lord. You want to make us healthy once again as we join into the family of you, Holy Spirit, uh, you, Father. So we just invite you to come speak to us. Lord, I, I ask that you would anoint my lips and my mind, quicken my thoughts, Lord, uh, to give your word in a way that is understandable and not just... Um, chaotic. Lord, I ask for your peace to come and rest on me, and I ask for your words to flow. What you want to speak, Lord, to your children, that you would speak it today. I, I make myself available for you. So in the name of Jesus, uh, we pray and we await for you to come. In your name, Lord, amen. All right, as we're moving through the Bible, we're in Mark chapter 6, if you have your Bible, you can open it there. What's happening? We need a troubleshoot. All right. Okay, in Mark chapter 6, it says, verse 1. He went away from there, talking about Jesus, and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hand? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not these his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and his own household. And he could do no mighty works there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among other villages. He left his hometown he comes back to his hometown, which is Nazareth. Um, he wasn't born there, as we know. He was born in Bethlehem, but Nazareth is where Jesus was schooled. It's where he grew up with his family, Mary and Joseph and his brothers and sisters. It's where he went to youth group. It's where he learned to be a carpenter. He's known there. If, if you guys have a small town that you're from, when you go back and you go to the grocery store, people nod their head because they know you, they saw their mother hold you in her arms and nurse you, and you are known there. He's back in his hometown where people know him. And they ask the question, like, how are such things given to this guy, to this one? This isn't his first time back to his hometown since his ministry began. This is his second time back in Luke, he goes, before he even calls his disciples to follow him, Jesus goes back to Nazareth, 
This is after he's tempted in the desert for 40 days. He goes into the synagogue. He opens up the scroll of the book of Isaiah, chapter 61, and he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach the good news, to heal the sick, to set the captives free. It's the year of the Lord's favor. He closes it, and then he looks at them and says, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And they marvel at him. And then he offends them the first time he's there too. He says, no doubt you, you want to see me do the works that you've heard that I've done elsewhere. You're going to say, physician, heal yourself. And he says, even in the times of Isaiah, there were sick people in Israel who weren't healed because of their unbelief. But God went to Naaman, a Gentile, and God went to these others who were seeking and looking for him to step into their lives, and God healed them. In that first visit to Nazareth, they were offended. They took him to the edge of a mountain where they wanted to throw him off and kill him. And it says Jesus went away from there. So now he comes back, and he's with his disciples back in his hometown once again. And they've heard of the works he's been doing. Those of you who've been like here each week following Jesus' life through the book of Mark, he just healed people all over the place. Last week, if you just read the bold, the bold type, Jesus heals a demon-possessed man. Jesus heals a woman and Jairus' daughter. He's doing these amazing things, raising people from the dead and casting demons out of guys who can take 10 people on and put people to shame. He's healing people all over the place. And word, no doubt, has gotten back to his hometown of what Jesus is doing elsewhere, the mighty works he's doing elsewhere. And I think there are times we hear about what Jesus is doing elsewhere. We hear about insane stuff happening in Africa or South America or up in Toronto or down in Florida and the great moves of God in other places. And we're encouraged by the stories and we nod our head, but how often do we think that God could move in that way right here, right now in our lives? And would we accept the way that he wants to step in to our life? Jesus has the power to heal, but they look at him and they say, how are such great works done by this man? How is such wisdom given to this man? And they marvel at him, and they've heard stories about him, and they can see that he has wisdom. They can see he knows stuff about God. They can see he's empowered in some way, but they are unwilling to accept him. And immediately, they start countering, and they look at anything they can find to criticize or to denounce the fact that he's coming with power. If you will, they're looking at how the gift is wrapped, and they're unwilling to accept the gift because it's coming in a brown paper bag rather than with nice bows. Because Jesus comes humbly, and that's the way he chose to come. A treasure that comes in wrapping that sometimes we're unwilling to accept. He comes to them, and they're looking at him, saying, how, how can this be God's answer to us in this man, in this ordinary man? And they start looking at what makes him ordinary. They start looking at why they should not accept what's coming from him, why they should be offended at him. And it says... He's a carpenter. Isn't this the carpenter from our hometown? Isn't this the mechanic? Isn't this the guy that works down at the tire barn? And he's going to come telling me about the righteousness of God. He's going to come telling me about how to know God and the Father and how to interpret the scriptures. Isn't this that homeless guy down at the Mitz bus stop? who's always standing on the corner, would you be willing to accept a gift from God coming from a homeless man? Or would you look at him as though you are superior and he is inferior, rationalizing in your mind, well, he's homeless, which means he's probably an addict and he probably deserves to be homeless. He's probably a sinner, so I shouldn't accept anything that's coming out of his mouth. He obviously can't have the wisdom he's acting like he has. And they're looking at Jesus like this. I think he was a real humble guy. I mean, humble in appearance and the whole package. It says in Isaiah, there's nothing stately about him that people would look at him and go, wow, I really want to receive from this guy. As soon as I met him, I knew there was something special there. No, I think there was nothing really stately about his appearance or his demeanor when he stepped in the room, except that he was kind and would put you at peace. 
They say, isn't this the carpenter? And then they say, isn't this Mary's son? Which is actually an insult. Because in that time, you were known by your father's name. A lot of you have son at the end of your last name, Jacob's son, Martin's son, whatever. Because back in the day, you were known by who your father was, not by who your mother was. And they say, isn't this Mary's son? Isn't this that bastard born here a while back? Not recognizing Joseph as his father, definitely not recognizing the Father in heaven as the Father of Jesus, which those of you who believe know that Jesus is the Son of God, born of a virgin in Mary's womb, placed there by the Holy Spirit to somehow be God and man wrapped up, come to us as the gift of God to cleanse us and free us. But they say, isn't this Mary's son? Isn't this that bastard son? We know about this guy's family. We know where he comes from. And then his family's around. It says all of his brothers and sisters are hanging out. And if you go to, if you go to Mark chapter 3, just a few chapters back, Jesus is speaking to a bunch of people and once again making a bunch of rabbis and strict religious Jews really angry with the things that he's saying. And his family comes and says, Jesus, come on, come on out here, man. And I think they're more worried about their reputation than him. I think they want to shut him up. Because in the religious society, Jesus is actually bringing a bad name on his family. And it says his family comes to him in Mark chapter 3 and they say, Jesus, come on out here, man. Stop talking like you're, you're digging the hole deeper for yourself. They want to kill you. And he looks at them and says, these aren't my mothers. These aren't my brothers. My mother and my brothers are those who hear my words and do it. His family sitting out there like, okay, if that's how it's going to be. And then who knows, this is a month later, a few weeks later, he shows up back in his hometown and his mother and brothers are there. What's, what do you think the talk is in his hometown, Nazareth, as his family comes back and they've just been kind of in some ways shut down by Jesus as they try to silence him? I can imagine, it says his mother and his brothers at least did not believe in him previous to his death and his resurrection. They believe afterwards, but most of them didn't believe before his death and resurrection. Do you think there's murmuring going on in the hometown? Younger brothers, younger siblings rolling their eyes at Jesus? Talking about the arrogance of him to talk to his family like that? Who does he think he is? And then he shows up back in Nazareth again. And I can imagine his family rolling their eyes as he's, oh my God, he's talking about the righteousness of God again. He's talking about the lamb that needs to be slain. Jesus. They've been hearing this probably for a long time and they're rolling their eyes. Can you imagine the people in the room checking out one another and the responses? And you have his brother in the back who's yawning, going, <laughs> whatever. They're tired of him. And he says, a prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown, among his own family and his own people. There's this saying that came on the scene even before Jesus' life. I think uh, this week it said 2 BC. This saying that many of you know, familiarity breeds contempt. Meaning, the more you are around someone, the longer that you know someone, it's easier, one, to take them for granted. Two, to think you've heard everything that that person has to say. I know all your opinions, all your thoughts. I know where you stand. I have you neatly boxed in in my mind. I have you figured out, and I'm bored with you. That's contempt for another person. And I think I can go so far as to say we should never put another person in that place where we hold them in contempt.
Familiarity doesn't have to breed contempt, but often it does. I think often in relationships especially. Those of you who are married or are looking to be married or looking to not be married or looking to not be in a relationship, know that there's a point when that magic, you know, that when you first meet someone and every time you look at them, there are these, these butterflies. And this person can do no wrong. And they're everything you've been looking for. They seem perfect. And then there's that moment, or maybe it's a, a, a process of transition where they become commonplace and you're familiar with them. And they're, they're really just another person. And at that point, we can make a decision are you bored with it? Do you move on in this endless pursuit of finding the perfect airbrushed person? Or do you push through in intimacy and learn who that person is in the deeper places? There's this movie, um, High Fidelity, with John Cusack and Jack Black. And it's actually, I watched it a few months ago, and in the end, it's pretty profound, actually. John Cusack, the whole movie, is kind of this immature guy with really good music taste who's dating this girl, and it's at the point where he either needs to marry her or go move on. And he moves on. And the whole movie is him going through this hard breakup and pursuing other women that are younger or have this other thing in common that the girl he really loves doesn't necessarily have that one thing in common, and he's bouncing around in all these relationships. And I can relate because I did that before I got married. I made the same jerky mistake of the endless pursuit of someone that would meet every need and be perfect. And he comes to this realization at the end as he's sitting with the girl that he actually loves. And he says, you know, that's a fantasy. I've been pursuing this fantasy. The other person always looks great from a distance. But then once you're in their life, it's the same things, you know? They have dirty underwear, and there's that thing they do that's gonna bug you, and we are all humans. And he says to her, he says, and you know what, you have those things too, but you're, you're the only one that I don't seem to tire of. I'm, I'm learning to love those things about you. And it's, he's actually choosing in the end to move into intimacy rather than forever running from it. And I share that because I think in that movie, He's familiar with her, and he, and he holds her in contempt until the end when he brings her back into his life and learns to cherish her and embrace her. And I think there are some of us who have grown up in the church very familiar with the scripture, very familiar with stories about Jesus. If I start a verse, you could probably end it for me and maybe roll your eyes and yawn or remember in youth group when you won the Bible verse contest with that very verse or whatever. You're familiar with the story. You're familiar with Jesus. But are you bored with him? Do you hold the Lord in contempt? I've got it figured out, you know, like he died, he's resurrected, he forgives me of my sins. I know the whole spiel. I keep coming each week because this is my culture and this is where my friendships are. But I know the spiel. I know who he is. Do you? Are you moving into him in intimacy? Another example, both my brother and sister uh, were art professors at Taylor and now are out in Seattle with the whole rush of Muncie folk who made their way out there. I know at the beginning of each year, they kind of grit their teeth saying, you get these freshman art students who come into class and they go to a gallery. Maybe they, they drive up to Chicago and go to the Museum of Modern Art and they're, they're, make, they're milling around from gallery to gallery and inevitably there's a few kids who look at a Picasso and it's, it's simple, it's a few shapes, a few colors and they roll their eyes and they say, this looks like a five-year-old could have done it, you know? I don't like this. This looks stupid. The perspective's not right. Is that me making that noise? They look at it, and 
They don't think the perspective's right. They don't like the colors. They don't like the way it's put together. But this is a masterpiece that people will fly from around the world to look at what a master of image can create. The simplicity and elegance of the lines and the colors chosen. People will write books trying to extrapolate on why Picasso chose certain colors and shapes and what is he trying to say. And there's a first year art student who's the critic and holds it in contempt and walks out saying, this is stupid, I could have done that, you know. And Gail and Zach as art professors need to grit their teeth and go, okay, you've got a lot to learn. <laughs> I think there are times we look at the Lord in that way, his simplicity and his elegance, and we think, I got that figured out. I understand, let's move on to something more complex, when maybe we don't get the simplicity and the elegance and the beauty of who he is, the masterpiece that God presents to us in Jesus the gift that God brings to us in Jesus Christ that he wants to us to accept in the simplicity and the elegance and the beauty of what he is. Interestingly, it says in verse 5, and he could do no mighty works there. It doesn't say he would do no mighty works there. It says, he could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief, their unbelief that he marveled at. The Lord marveled at their unbelief. That's the verse I've been chewing on all week long, you guys, that he could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief, unbelief which he marveled at. He's been going from town to town, healing the sick, raising the dead, restoring people's souls and minds and personalities and relationships from town to town, bringing the very power and gift of God to the people. And he could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. Do you know that there are times we can limit God's power in our life because of our unbelief in Him? That He's chosen a relationship with us and faith is what enacts His power in our life. Do you believe that? It says, by faith we are saved. In the book of John, people come to Him and say, Teacher, what are the good works I must do um, to do the works of the kingdom? What are the works of God that I must do? to do the works of the kingdom and to be saved. And he says, the work of God is this, that you believe in him whom God sent. That's our work. That we believe in him who God sent, which is the Lord. That's our work. That's it. That we believe in him whom God sent. And in this town, in his hometown, he could do no good works because they did not believe and he marvels at their unbelief. That it says God is the God of the impossible. He's the God who can bring into being from nothing. These stories that we hear of God doing things elsewhere, these stories we hear of what God has done in the past or in someone else's life in this room, the promises He's given us, He wants us to believe Him and to experience the mighty works that He's wanting to do in our own lives. Do you believe that God wants to do mighty things in and through you? He does. heard this quote also this week, that there aren't dead places. Sometimes we talk about lands in the 1040 window or in Europe or in our own town as if that's, that's a dead place. The Lord's done with that place. That's not true. There aren't dead places. There's just dead faith. When there's revival, it's because people are choosing to once again believe in Jesus. 
And that faith excites God to bring the power of God. That he could do no works there. That's a, I've been chewing on that sentence all week long. What is God wanting to do in my life, in your life, in this town, in this church? What is he longing to do? What are the plans that he's established for us? When he says, you will do greater works, that I will be with you. That you will see greater things than these. Do we limit him by our unbelief? Would God marvel at your belief or marvel at your unbelief? There are times in the Bible where God marvels at people's belief. There's the centurion who has the sick servant and he comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, I have this sick servant. You don't need to come with me. Just by your very word, he'll be healed. I have men that are underneath me and I know what it is to have authority and I know if you speak the word, Jesus, he will be healed. And Jesus steps back and goes, oh my. I've not seen such faith in all of Israel. And this is a Gentile who understands who I am and the authority that I've been given. And he marvels at this guy's belief and says, go home. It's, it's done. As you say, you believed. Read the book of John and count how many times Jesus talks to us about belief. We humans are made to believe. It's against our nature not to believe. And it's limiting to all that we are supposed to be as sons and daughters of God when we do not believe him. when we settle for this is the way things are and they cannot progress beyond this. Something my brother-in-law Zach said as I was a brand new Christian that I've held close to me. He looked at me and said, this thing goes as far as you want it to go. You're a believer now. Your eyes have been opened. You believe in him. It goes as far as you want it to go. Meaning, as long as you're believing and moving into him, it's just going to keep opening up into new places, unexpected places. You can't fathom what he may do, the plans that he has. This thing will go as far as you will take it. Would God marvel at your belief like the centurion? Would he marvel at your belief like Joshua and Caleb, who are the only two who don't perish in the desert, but they believe what God says, that this is the land that I've destined for you. And they cross over with the new generation over the Jordan and have battle after battle after battle after battle that they win. Caleb's rad. The very end of his life, he's like 85, 95, 100. I don't know, they lived old back then. The very end of his life, you know, when he should settle. He's getting old. He's... He's one of the only two guys who made it into the promised land. He looks at this hill where the giants live. And Caleb says, I'm not done. God said, this is our land, and that's where I want to retire. Up there where the giants live. And in his old age, he fights his hardest battle. He marches up the hill as an 85-year-old man and defeats these giants that live on a hill. Would God marvel at your belief? I think Caleb had that mindset. This thing goes as far as you will take it. God's promises are beyond what you can even see. But if you hear him and will believe him and walk out on that, you will see him come in power on your behalf because that's what he's destined you for if you're a child of God. Caleb ends well. Not many people end well in the Bible. That's my prayer is that I can end well, that you can end well. that you will take it as far as he has ordained you and planned for you to take it, that you wouldn't settle, that you wouldn't in your mind think, I've reached my spiritual plateau, I've reached my relational plateau, I've reached my plateau of mental, physical, spiritual healing. This is where I need to retire. Would God marvel at your belief or your unbelief? He marvels at their unbelief. And it limits what he would do there. He could do no good works and he moves on. There are other times in the Bible that God marvels at unbelief. 
when he's in the boat with his own disciples, and I can relate to his disciples. I'm not a giant of belief. I give in so easy. Each week I hit a point where I feel like life is caving in and it's all over and I want to throw in the towel. Each week I hit those points. I might be an emotional person, but... Trying to figure out where the sweet spots are. What's that? Why don't you give up and take that one? This? Yeah. Okay. All right. I feel more like James Brown now. But when he's in the boat with his disciples, the storm comes, and they freak out and run into the bottom of the boat where Jesus is peacefully asleep, and they're screaming, Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? Don't you know we're dying? How many, how many of us hit that point a lot? Lord, don't you care that I'm sinking? And he wakes up and says, you have little faith. And he walks on the front of the boat, and he's like, shh. And it's still. And I think the disciples realize, dang, we got a lot to learn. And I realize I've got a lot to learn. I, I disbelieve so easily. Let's let God marvel at our belief. Let's not be those who would limit him. Your work is just to believe in him who God sent. That's Jesus. And he will show the way and he will be there. Let's move on. Actually, first though, he moves on to the next town. I wanted to, I see something here and this is something I had to learn really quickly when I was pastoring down in Indianapolis is not to spend 90% of my energy to appease one or two critics who I will never appease. Those folks in the body or in your life that hold your life of faith or what you're doing in contempt. Who would always have you bend to their will and will never be satisfied. I learned not to spend 90% of my time to appease one person. When there's this whole group that are actively seeking God and are believing him to do great things. And it says Jesus moves on from there. He doesn't stay week after week after week whipping a dead horse. He moves on to the next town. And he instructs his disciples, we move on. We're only going to go to verse 14. We're not doing the whole chapter in case you're getting scared. And he sends his disciples on their first... uh, short-term mission trip, and he gives them some parameters. It says, and he called the 12, in verse 7, and he called the 12 and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. And he charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and to not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you, um, when you leave, shake the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that the people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So these are the guys in Jesus' life who do believe. Who believe so much so that they're following him and treating him as their rabbi and are willing to follow every word he says. And he reaches a point here after they visited him with his hometown and seen his hometown reject him, he says, now I'm going to send you out. And he gives them these parameters. He says, I want you to go two by two. Two is a good number to travel with. One for accountability. Four. 
for strength. And it says a witness is established by two people. He says, I want you to go out two by two into all of the towns. And I'm giving you authority. I'm sending you. And I'm giving you authority over all the unclean spirits. That when we are sent by God, I believe there will be an interaction with and a confrontation with spirits that are not the Holy Spirit. And for those of you who maybe are new here and new to the Bible, new to hearing about who God is, there is one spirit that is good and pure and holy. So much so that when you invite him into your life and into your very being, God calls your body his temple and he wants to come reside in your temple. And if that spirit were not good, that would be very frightening. If he twisted your arms into doing things against your will, but the Holy Spirit doesn't work that way. He waits for us to pray and say, Lord, your will be done, and I long to follow you into your will. The Holy Spirit is good and pure. And will wash you clean and make you feel like a child again and put you at peace. That's who the Holy Spirit is. The Spirit of God. But there are unclean spirits in the world, spirits that have rebelled against God and are doing all they can to pervert and destroy and hurt and make us do things against our will and against the will of God. And Jesus says, I'm giving you authority against all unclean spirits who are going to try to pervert your way because they know that I'm sending you. And they'll try to trip you up in any way they can. They will try to lie and deceive. And those who have given in to them will either run from you or try to confront you and intimidate you and lie to you and make you fear and disbelieve me, but I'm giving you authority over them. That in my name, they will be cast out. You've seen me do it, Jesus says to them. Now I'm giving you authority to do the same by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the name of Jesus. He says, I'm giving you this authority. This is a promise, guys. And then he gives them these parameters, which are really interesting. He says, and I don't want you to take anything with you. No money, no weapons, if some of you have old translations, it says no money bag and it says no scrip. And what a scrip is, is a money bag that you would take alms, that you would go around begging. Hey, the Lord has called me to do thus and such. Please give me money so that I can accomplish the Lord's will. He says, I don't want you begging. And I don't want you taking so much with you that you have it all taken care of. He doesn't say, I want you to go to REI, get yourself a nice big backpack, jam that thing full of granola, raise $10,000, stay in these specific hotels. He doesn't want them to minister from a place of excess, of I'm the glass that's totally filled. I am self-sufficient and I'm coming into your town with my sufficiency to heap money and to heap what I have upon you. He actually sends them without provision, seemingly really unprepared. He doesn't want them begging, but he wants them ready to receive. There's a difference between those two. Brother Andrew, uh, I forget what country Brother Andrew's from. Somewhere where near Lars lives, and uh, I forget which country that is. But uh, Brother Andrew wrote this book, The God Smuggler. It's an awesome book. You should check it out. He, he like went back when communist Russia was a scary deal. He would go in there and minister the gospel when it was illegal to do so. And in the book, he has this saying that he always tries to choose the royal way. And the royal way, meaning if we're following God and Jesus, who is the king, and who has all authority and all provision and can move mountains 
and can do anything that he would will to do to help and support you. If you're following that one and he is the one who has sent you, you shouldn't have to go digging in the gutters to finance your way. And there are times when Brother Andrew is tempted because he doesn't see a way to do the very thing that God has required him and told him to do. He's tempted to choose a lesser way, a way of groveling. Of acting like he's just a beggar in the kingdom when no, he's being sent by the Almighty One. And over and over and over and over again, he realizes when he chooses to just go. And he might not even have what he needs, but he just goes. God provides for him miraculously. Me and Michelle have seen it over this past year even. The way people have come alongside of us and without us having to say a word a check will show up in the mail at the right time and it just blows our minds and we're so thankful. Jesus says, I don't want you taking a beggar's bag, but I also don't want you going with the thousands of dollars you've raised so that you can be self-sufficient. I don't even want you to take two sets of clothes. I want you to take a walking staff and a pair of sandals and I want you to go two by two with the authority I've given you and the words I've given you. And when you're going, you will come into contact with those who recognize what God has sent you to do and they will come alongside of you. And they will help you. You will come into contact with people like what's called the man of peace. When you go into a town and there's someone who recognizes, wow, this guy's doing the work of God and I want to be a support to them. People will find you because God will move in their hearts to come alongside of you. And that's why Jesus says in verse 10 and 11, when you go into a town, find that one who is ready to receive you who's ready to receive what I've sent you to do and stay with that one. Don't jump around from town to town, I mean from house to house. Going where you find the best meal and the comfiest bed. Find the one who resonates with you and what I've sent you to do. That is the man of peace in that village. Stay with him. Be willing to receive from him as he is willing to receive from you, accept his hospitality. And then he says, if no one is willing to receive you, shake the dust off your feet, and the very dust will be a witness against them because I sent you with a gift. I sent you with a gift, and they did not accept the gift. And he doesn't say curse them and stand on the corner yelling whoremonger and whatever else. He just says, keep moving. Keep moving with the gift that I've given you. And they preached, and they preached repentance. And people heard and people turned and people were healed and God's power went with them. And they preached repentance, which means to turn. And in the face of what we're looking at today, it means to turn from unbelief to belief. When living in a place of unbelief, we live in a place of limiting God's work in our life, God's power to heal, God's ability to empower. We limit God calling us to be sons and daughters of God. That's unbelief. And we hold that gift in contempt and we say, I can take care of my own life. I have my own ideas and opinions about what a good life for me looks like. And I have my own ideas and my own opinions. And opinions are different than convictions. And a lot of us have opinions. I have my own opinions of who God is. Like Nancy said, she had ideas and opinions of who God was. 
and how he was supposed to work and what she should do to win his approval. And she says she's been being changed of that. That ultimately we need to repent of unbelief and believe in Jesus. And when we do, there will be things that he wants us to set down. Maybe some of them are really blatant. When I came to him, I knew I had to stop smoking pot. I had to stop looking at pornography. I had to stop doing these things that I knew even as an unbeliever. These things are destructive and they're hurting me. There are some of those real obvious ones that you know when I come to God, I need to be healed of these and I need to let go of these. But I don't even want us to get off track looking at the peripheral things. And peripheral, I mean, when we're not believing God, we do a lot of dumb things. We get prideful. We get arrogant. We get self-righteous. We can love our system of religion more than Jesus and refuse intimacy with him. And actually, when he comes to our front door, hold him in contempt and say, I don't want you in here. We need to turn from unbelief to belief in Jesus. And like his disciples, even be willing to feel like we're not prepared for life now. I don't have any control of what I'm going to do tomorrow. When I wasn't believing him, I at least had this stuff lined up and in shape. And I had the comfort and the control of knowing I can take care of it. I can be self-sufficient when we follow him. He may take away your self-sufficiency. And that's scary for you, isn't it? It's scary for me. It's very scary but he gives us this promise that I will be with you. Your work now is to believe in Jesus and to take that as far as it will go. Like Caleb in your old age, to fight your greatest battles in your 80s, to take it as far as it will go and to believe in him and not be the one that perishes in the desert because we grumbled and wouldn't believe God's words, but to be him even in the midst of the greatest trial that says, I'm going to believe. So I want to call you today to stand up and believe. There are some of you who maybe have never believed in Jesus. And like the disciples preached, I think I'm put here today to say you need to repent. Yes, you have sins, but you need to repent of your unbelief in Jesus. He's the son of God, and you've been making your argument of why you shouldn't believe in him. Why you don't want to believe in him. Why you can hold him and his words in contempt, and he's saying today, stop it. I'm marveling at your unbelief, and I'm going to call you to belief today. I want you to stand up and believe in him. There are some of you who have been in church for a long time and rolling your eyes and yawning at Jesus because you think you have him figured out and you think you've reached a plateau of your faith and you're just supposed to show up each week now. That's not the life he has for you. He would marvel at that unbelief too and say, my child, stand up. I want to do so much more in your life My child, believe in Jesus. Believe that he is who he says he is. And the promise you think you received years back, I want you to believe that now and stop holding it in contempt. I want you to accept what I want to do. I want you to be so intimate with me that you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, that you might even feel unprepared for this life. But I'm going to be with you and you're going to see my power in your weakness. Because that's what he does. So as we sing this last song, I just want us to stand up and in your mind think, I'm going to stand up into belief. And I don't know what's going to happen after that. But I know I want to believe in the Lord and stop sitting away from him. Stop barring him. Stop holding him in contempt. Let's believe in him and see what comes. Amen.